Hello, I'm Josh Demude, and welcome to the sixth lecture of Unit 3 of CSE 550 on network flows and matchings. Up till this point in the unit, we've only been talking about the maximum flow problem and its relationship to minimum cut. We've also seen both the ford fulkerson and edmunds karp algorithms, which were basically one and the same, and we've seen an example of how those algorithms work. Here, we're going to be shifting our attention to a different kind of flow uh, called the minimum cost flow. We're going to define an optimality criterion similar to the way that maximum flow had augmenting paths. Here we're going to be looking at augmenting cycles. And then we're going to look at an algorithm that uses this criteria in order to form, uh, in order to discover a minimum cost flow. So the minimum cost flow problem generalizes maximum flow. In particular, it sort of combines two things that we've seen uh, up to this point in class. So we've seen the maximum flow problem, which has edge capacities, right? How much flow can we actually send on any given edge of the graph? We've also seen shortest path, where there are costs or weights on the edges. So every time we use an edge, we have to pay for it. This is exactly what the minimum cost flow is going to force us to do. Um, we can go back to our water in pipes and plumbing example. Imagine that we are trying to flow water from one place to another, but not only do the pipes have different sizes, which is like edge capacities, but also we need to pay for how much water we're actually moving through each pipe. And maybe certain pipes are nicer than others or they're owned by different companies. Anyway, whatever it is, we have to pay different costs potentially depending on which pipes we're using. The formal definition that's really relevant to this problem is a so-called B flow which is gonna take a moment to unpack. This is similar to an ST flow, except for now there's no specific source S or sync T. Instead, all of the nodes now just have these things called node balances on them. There's a couple things we should know about node balances. First of all, when you add up all the balances across the entire graph, the balances are equal to zero. But maybe more importantly, the balance tells you how much flow is created or destroyed at each node. So before we had flow conservation, right? We said that for all nodes that were not S and T, flow is neither created nor destroyed. It is only distributed. We needed the amount coming into a node to be equal to the amount of flow leaving that node. We're now generalizing this. Instead of saying there's just one source S and one sink T, we're now saying there could be lots of sources and lots of sinks that each generate their own amount of flow, generate or absorb, I should say. So let's look, actually skipping past edge capacities for a second. You'll notice that this is similar to maximum flow, but instead of flow conservation, we have a constraint called flow balance. Here, the difference in flow entering and the difference in flow leaving must equal the balance, specifically the flow coming out of a node V minus the flow coming into a node V must equal BV. And this is true for all nodes. So there's no special nodes like S and T anymore. This is true for everyone. Now let's investigate this a little deeper. If the balance of a node is zero, so this whole equation is equal to zero, then we're exactly back in the flow conservation world, right? The amount coming out is equal to the amount coming in because their difference is equal to zero. If the balance is positive, then looking at these two sums, if B of V is positive, it shouldn't be too hard to recognize that it must be the flow coming out of the node, which is greater than the flow coming into the node in order for B of V to be greater than zero. This means that for any node, where B of V is positive, that node is acting like a source. It is generating new flow. There's more flow coming out of that node than there is coming in. Likewise, if B of V is negative, then it's easy to see that the flow coming into that node must be the larger amount when compared to what's going out. So any node with B of V less than zero is acting like a sink. It's absorbing flow. There is more flow coming into that node than there is flow leaving it. So in this way, the minimum cost flow generalizes maximum flow 
by allowing for many possible sources and sinks, each having their own different amounts that they're generating or amounts that they're absorbing. Just like in maximum flow, we still have the edge capacity constraints. We're not allowed to send more flow than we have capacity for. Um, but that's really the only difference is now we have these node balances. So looking at the example on the right hand side, uh, there's a lot of numbers happening here. So actually, before I show the example, let's just talk quickly about what's going on here. So first of all, you'll notice there's no S or T. They're all just nodes. And notice now that edges have two numbers. This is because they have both a capacity, which is the left-hand number, and a weight or a cost, which will be the number on the right-hand side. Then when we look at the actual example here, the numbers in green are the node balances. Uh, as always, the blue arrows and the blue numbers are the flow. So for example, A is a node that is supposed to generate eight flow. And indeed, we see six flow being sent out the top edge and two flow being sent out the bottom edge, which is in total eight. If we look at this node up here, B, it has a balance of zero. So this is where, for example, like normal flow conservation kicks in. B neither creates nor destroys flow. So it must simply take the six that it gets and it must distribute it elsewhere. C on the other hand, is generating one additional flow. So we see that indeed it gets two, adds a new unit of flow, and out comes three flow. F, on the other hand, does the opposite. It absorbs or destroys one unit of flow. So three units come in, but only two go out. Um, you can do this exercise for all of the other nodes. The only one I will say here is G. G is absorbing uh, seven units of flow. And indeed, we see the seven coming into it with nothing leaving. All right, so what makes a B flow good or bad? What are we minimizing in this minimum cost flow problem? Well, the whole game of the minimum cost flow problem is to find a B flow that minimizes this quantity. Now, this actually should look very, very familiar to you um, if you think about shortest path. In shortest path, we were collecting some edges, and then we summed over all edges and multiplied the cost or the weight of that edge times whether or not we included that edge. Here, the minimum cost flow problem is more general. Uh, instead of just thinking about whether we're using an edge or not, like a zero one binary decision, now we have flow amounts, right? Which could be zero, could be up to the capacity, or could be any amount in between. So if we look here at this example, um, we are paying some very large amount, actually. Uh, so the unit cost, the cost we pay for each unit that we send, for example, along A to B, is four. And we're sending six units of flow. So that's we're paying six times four is 24 just for this one edge. And then we have to do that as a sum over all possible edges. So for example, uh, B to E, we are sending five units of flow. We pay three uh, for each unit. So that's 15. Uh, one times one is one. Two times two is four. Three times four is 12, and so on. We add up all of this, and that becomes the cost of our B flow. OK, so now that we understand what a B flow is and what we're trying to minimize, Let's go off and let's try to investigate and see if there's some kind of structure that we can use to determine when we have an optimal minimum cost flow. So uh, just like how maximum flows had F augmenting paths, B flows care about F augmenting cycles. Uh, I'll re-say these again in just a moment, but sort of high level. This is exactly the same kind of edge traversal that was allowed by F augmenting paths in max flow. All that's different now is that we actually need it to be a cycle. We need this thing to start and end at the same node, whereas F augmenting paths started one place and ended some other place. Um, but the edge traversals that we're allowing are exactly the same. So here, we're allowed to go forwards on an edge if that edge has some flow room left over, right? If there's some capacity left over, because there's strictly less flow than there was capacity. 
And we're allowed to go backwards if there's positive flow on the edge. So here, if you look at uh, this example B flow, which is what we had on the last slide, then this here is an F augmenting cycle. Let's just quickly look at that cycle. Let's say it starts at A. We see that it's going forward from A to C. Why is that? Well, because two flow is strictly less than five. So we are allowed to go forwards there. Likewise, we're allowed to go forwards from C to D because there's zero flow, which is strictly less than the capacity of one. But then in the next two edges, we're going backwards, right? From D to B, that's opposite the direction of the edge. So we're going backwards and same with B to A. And we're allowed to go backwards on these two edges because there is positive flow on both of them. So this becomes an F augmenting cycle. The reason we care about F augmenting cycles is just like how with F augmenting paths, we tried to push some additional flow through to make our value better. Here, we're going to cycle flow on our F augmenting cycle in a way that makes our cost lower without changing the fact that node balances and flow amounts are kept more or less the same. Uh, so for example, if we looked at this cycle here, what we could do is we could take away one unit of flow from the A to B and B to D, and we could add it instead from A to C and C to D. So essentially we're pushing one unit of flow on this whole cycle. If we were to do that, all the balances end up still being the same, but we will have changed the amounts on each edge, which then change our cost. Um, so hopefully, if we do this right, we'll find F augmenting cycles that when we augment on them, give us a lower cost, which will get us closer to the goal of the problem. Here's the main theorem. So in max flow, we had a theorem that said a flow is maximum if and only if there are no F augmenting paths. This is exactly the same kind of theorem. A B flow has minimum cost if and only if there does not exist an F augmenting cycle with negative total weight. Okay, so negative total weight is the important piece of this. It's not just any F augmenting cycle that will give us a lower cost uh, B flow. It's only those with negative total weight. This brings us to what is called the minimum mean cycle canceling algorithm. Uh, this is a very easy algorithm to understand once you understand Ford Fulkerson very well. Once again, we just start with something feasible. Then we have a while loop that says, while there is the object of interest for Fulk Ford Fulkerson, that was an F augmenting path. Now it's an F augmenting cycle with negative total weight. We can go off and we can do the same augmentation operations that we did for Ford Fulkerson. And we keep doing this until there is no F augmenting cycle with negative total weight left. Once we're done, once we can't find such a thing, this theorem tells us that indeed we have found a B flow of minimum cost. The last thing that's worth saying about this is this minimum mean weight piece. That's where this algorithm gets its name, the minimum mean cycle canceling algorithm. This is just like how when we went from Ford Fulkerson to Edmonds Carp, Edmonds Carp said, hey, it's not just any F augmenting path you want, it's a shortest F augmenting path. Uh, this algorithm is essentially doing the same thing. It's saying, hey, it's not just any negative total weight F augmenting cycle that you want, it's the one with minimum mean weight. And if you do this, then eventually you will reach a B flow in polynomial time. Um, so that concludes our lecture on minimum cost flows, and actually the part of this entire unit that deals with flows at all. In the next part of this lecture series, we will be talking about maximum matchings.